Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. And by... Jacqueline Brown, author of The Light Series, a best-selling Catholic fiction series that will leave you asking, who would I become if the world fell away? Enter code MYSTERIOUSWORLD at Jacqueline-Brown.com for 10% off. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. Previously on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. You're listening to episode one of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. In this episode, we'll be talking about ghosts. The bottom line for me is that ghosts are real and we should be open to reports of ghostly activity, but we should also exercise critical thinking and say, are there other possible explanations here? You're listening to episode 115 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the strange story of the wizard clip. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1794, a family in Virginia gave shelter to a dying traveler. They cared for all his needs except one they did not summon a priest to give him the last rites. After he died, the family began to experience a series of supernatural manifestations which did not cease until they summoned Catholic priests to deal with the matter. What were these manifestations? How much credibility do they have? What caused them? Was it demons? Was it ghosts? Was it both? And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what do we need to talk about before we begin? I want to give you credit, Dom, because I had not initially heard about this mystery. You were the one back when we first began the podcast a couple of years ago who added it to the spreadsheet we keep of ideas of future shows. Today, the big list has more than a thousand future topics on it. But back then it was much smaller. And when you added the wizard clip... I did some preliminary research, but I didn't find what I would consider really good historical sources. I only saw brief modern summaries, and I wasn't sure if there was enough here to make a whole episode. But eventually, I hit pay dirt. I found a bunch of really good quality sources, and so today I'm really excited to be able to tell people about the story. I think people will be really interested to hear about it, too. This mystery involves Skinwalker Ranch-level weirdness. We discussed Skinwalker Ranch, a site in Utah, back in episode 36, and it's a location where all kinds of high strangeness has been reported, including livestock dying and being dismembered under mysterious circumstances, strange lights, mental voices, and objects being strangely moved or damaged. Well, all of that and more happened in Wizard Clip, Virginia. So hold on to your hats and stay tuned. <laughs> All right. So let's start by meeting the family that's at the center of this mystery. When and where did they live? The name of the family was the Livingstons, and in the 1790s, they were living in what was then the state of Virginia in the newly independent United States. In 1794, when the events began, the United States was so new that the Revolutionary War had only been won 11 years earlier, and the U.S. Constitution was only five years old, with the nation having previously been governed under the Articles of Confederation. The town in which the Livingstons dwelt wasn't even officially a town yet. The town wouldn't be chartered by an act of the Virginia legislature until 1798, after the events we're going to describe were already well underway. Originally, the town was called Smithfield because it was settled on land owned by a family named Smith. 
But there was a problem, because there was another town in Virginia called Smithfield, so they needed a new name. Since the town was a center of commerce between several other towns and was midway between them, it became known as Middleway. In the underpopulated early United States, it was a very small place by modern standards. And even today, there were only 441 people living there at the time of the most recent census back in 2010. Today, it also isn't classified as being in the state of Virginia because at the time of the Civil War, Virginia split in two. And so Middleway is now in the state of West Virginia. It also goes by another name. Because of the events of our story, Middleway also came to be called Wizard Clip, the town of Wizard Clip. It also came to be known as Clip Town and just Clip, and its inhabitants came to be known as Clippers. So what can you tell us about the individual members of the Livingston family? The father of the family was named Adam Livingston. He had been born in Pennsylvania, and he came from Dutch ancestry. He had moved his family to Smithfield or Middleway or Wizard Clip or Clip Town or Clip in 1790 from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Like almost everybody back then, he was a farmer and he owned a plot of 70 acres in Smithfield. He had a reputation for being honest and hardworking as well as being kind and hospitable. And he was also Lutheran. His wife, Mrs. Livingston, was a Presbyterian, and together they are known to have had three sons and four daughters. Uh, so how did the mysterious events at Wizard Clip begin? In 1794, the family took a visitor to the area into their home as a boarder. This was not uncommon at the time because there were very few inns and lodges, so people often took visitors into their homes. This visitor was an Irishman who is described as being of middle age and respectable appearance. Respectability, of course, being a quality you'd want anyone you took in your home to have. But according to an article published in the West Virginia Historical Magazine Quarterly in 1904, In a few days after the arrival of this traveler, he was taken sick, and as his illness became more threatening, he called Livingston to his bedside, informed him that he was a Catholic, and inquired of him if there was not a priest somewhere in his neighborhood whose services he could procure, should his malady prove fatal, which he had reason to then fear it would. Livingston, who was an intensely bigoted member of the Lutheran Church, very gruffly replied to him that he knew of no priest in that neighborhood, and if there was one, he should never pass the threshold of his door. The dying man repeated his entreaties for the spiritual aid of a Catholic priest, but Livingston was inexorable and refused to countenance his request. The stranger died, his name being unknown to his host, and there being nothing among his papers to throw any light upon his history. However, a more generous account of the matter was published in 1873 in the book Life of Demetrius Augustus Galitzin, which told the story this way. A poor Irish traveler, a Catholic, being ill while in Livingston's neighborhood, was taken into his house, carefully nursed and attended through his last sickness, and properly buried. The only thing Mr. Livingston refused to do for the sick man was to send for a priest for him. He'd never seen one, and in common with the generality of his class, had probably very extraordinary ideas of Catholic priests, many actually believing that they were the living emissaries of Satan, that they had horns, like their master, and various other equally enlightened fancies. Nothing, therefore, could induce any of the Livingstons to accede to the dying man's entreaty, and this, through no hardness of heart, it must be understood— for they were all of kindly disposition, but because to them the request was absurd, of no consequence, and a great deal better disregarded. Whichever account is more accurate, it is certainly the case that there were very few Catholics and even fewer Catholic priests in Virginia at the time. Maryland had been the colony with the most Catholics, which is why Baltimore was the seat of the first Catholic diocese in the United States. However, once you crossed over into neighboring Virginia, the Catholic population dropped precipitously. Adam Livingston thus may not have had any idea how to get a hold of a priest to care for the spiritual needs of the Irish traveler, whatever he otherwise might have made of the request. In any event, no priest was called, and the same night that the man died, weird things started happening. What was the first thing they noticed? According to the 1904 West Virginia Historical Magazine article, on the night of his death, Livingston employed a man by the name of Jacob Foster to sit up with the corpse. But so soon as the candles were lighted in the chamber of the dead man, 
After giving a weak and flickering light, they went out, and the room was left in darkness. They were relighted several times, supposing it to result from some remedial defect, but with the same result. Livingston then brought two candles into the room, which he had been using in his own family room, which were about one-third burnt down, and which he knew to be good. But so soon as they were placed in the room with the corpse, they became immediately extinguished. This so alarmed Foster that he abandoned his vigils and left the house. Yeah, so he was unnerved by all that. <laughs> so, Jimmy, why would someone sit up with a corpse? Well, historically, one reason you do it is to pray for the soul of the departed person. And that's something that we'll talk more about later on. In different contexts, though, now, since the Livingstons were Protestant, they wouldn't have been praying for the traveler's soul. But still, it had survived as a custom, as something where you would show respect by sitting up and having a wake, meaning you stay awake with the dead person there. And, uh, you know, partly it can be to guard the body, although there wasn't really any danger. It's more of a formality, but it's really more a sign of respect. And in in other circumstances, it would also be a chance for the family to say goodbye, you know, to kind of absorb what was going on and to show respect for their departed loved one. And even though the traveler wasn't a member of their family, so he wasn't one of their loved ones, they still did the customary thing for him. They then continued to do the customary thing. They buried the visitor. But the candles going out only proved to be the first strange event because... On the night succeeding the burial, the peace of Livingston was much disturbed by the apparent sound of horses galloping round his house. He frequently rose during the night, which was a beautiful moonlit night, to satisfy his mind. While he could distinctly hear the tramp of steeds, he could see nothing to assure him that it was anything more than a figment of his own imagination. In about a week afterward, his barn was burnt and his cattle all died. The crockery ware in his house, without any visible agency, was thrown upon the floor and broken. His money disappeared. The heads of his turkeys and chickens dropped off and chunks of burning wood would leap from the fireplace several feet out into the floor, endangering the building unless promptly replaced. Soon the annoyances, which were then destroying his peace, assumed a new form. The sound of a large pair of shears could be distinctly heard in his house, clipping in the form of half-moons and other curious figures, his blankets, sheets and counterpanes, boots and shoes, clothing, etc. This was all in one night, but the operation of clipping continued for upwards of three months, a small portion of it only being done at a time, but the inexorable shears never being silent 24 hours at a time. By this time, the news of these strange proceedings was spread through the country for 30 miles around and attracted in an especial manner the curiosity of the citizens of Smithfield. So the phenomena that we have being reported so far include candles going out, the sound of invisible horses galloping, a barn burning, livestock dying, and being dismembered, uh, crockery being broken, money disappearing, hot coals jumping out of the fireplace, crescent moon shapes, or according to other accounts like this one, half moon shapes being cut out of fabric, and the frequent sound of clipping as with a big pair of shears or scissors. No wonder people in the area started talking about all the things that were being reported. And it was the regular sound of clipping that led to the name Wizard Clip. The easy part of the name to explain is the clip, because that was definitely inspired by the clipping sound that the Livingston family and others heard on the property. The harder part is the wizard element. From what I've been able to tell so far, it appears that this may have just been speculation from common folk that a supernatural entity who they imagined as a wizard was responsible for the clipping noise. In fact, I've found references to the spirit being called the Wizard Clip or the Wizard of Middleway. Whatever the origin, Wizard Clip is the name that stuck, and soon that's what the town was called. And so today it's even just called Clip, and the people, as we mentioned, are called Clippers. You mentioned that people outside the Livingston family were witnesses to these events. Can you give us one example? In a letter that Father Demetrius Galitzin wrote in 1839, he records one incident that occurred with a woman who had heard about the cloth items being cut into crescent moon shapes. He writes, During one day at a tea party in nearby Martinsburg, an old Presbyterian lady, who was one of the invited, told the company what was going on at Livingston's. 
To satisfy her curiosity, she went to Livingston's house. However, before entering in, she took off her new black silk cap, wrapped it up in a new silk handkerchief, and when she opened it, she found her cap cut into narrow ribbons or ribbons. We thus have non-Catholic witnesses apparently acknowledging that strange things were going on at the Livingston farm. And what did the Livingstons do in response to all this? They started turning to clergy for assistance, and being Protestant, they naturally turned to Protestant clergy first. Being Lutheran, Mr. Livingston first went to a Lutheran pastor. In his 1820 book, Letter to a Protestant Friend on the Holy Scriptures, Father Galitzin recounts, Livingston reading in his Bible that Christ had given to his ministers power over evil spirits, started from home to Winchester in Virginia, and having, with tears in his eyes, related to his minister, Parson S., the history of his distress, losses, and sufferings, begged of him to come to his house and to exercise in his favor the power he had received from Jesus Christ. The parson candidly confessed that he had no such power. The good old man insisted that he must have that power, for he found it in his Bible. The parson replied that that power existed only in old times, but was done away now. The old man, although living in this enlightened age, had not sagacity enough to understand the distinction between old times and new times, but according to your minister's rule, believed nothing but what he found contained in his Bible. This type of encounter would not be unexpected. Mainstream Protestant theology, especially at the time, tended to draw a sharp distinction between what happened in the apostolic age and what happens afterwards, with the claim that miracles ceased. And this is one reason why Protestantism has not generally maintained the practice of exorcism, you know, which is right there in the Bible and which the Catholic Church has maintained and other Christians have maintained, but not in the Protestant community, really. And that's what Mr. Livingston was after. The desire to partition the age of miracles off from the rest of the Christian age may have been in part produced by a desire to undercut Catholics pointing to miracles occurring after the apostolic age down through history to, you know, validate their faith. However, the position is not easy to sustain from the biblical text. There are no verses saying that the age of miracles is going to cease, so there's a tension between the Protestant idea of sola scriptura, the idea that we should base doctrine on scripture alone, and the idea that miracles have have ceased. And there could be tension as a result between laity and clergy, because the laity want assistance of a supernatural nature from their clergy, and they wouldn't have seen anything in the Bible saying they couldn't have it. In this case, Livingston didn't see any biblical reason why his Lutheran pastor, a minister of Christ, shouldn't have power over evil spirits and be able to help him out. If I can be permitted a momentary digression, I'm aware of a sort of flip side of this occurring about a century and a half earlier in the 1640s. In his book, Magic and Superstition in Europe, historian Michael Bailey writes, In one case in the 1640s, a Protestant clergyman instructed a farmer that he should not use a particular spell to quell fires. Rather than accepting his pastor's authority, the man immediately got his family Bible and demanded that the pastor show him where, in God's revealed word, such spells were explicitly forbidden. Here we see a wonderful example of how, if Protestantism could not fully eliminate common spells and charms, it certainly could transform the way in which people viewed and justified these rites. I have to say that I have sympathy for both the pastor and the farmer in this incident. The pastor is trying to keep the farmer from using what he regards as a spell, that is a an unauthorized and dangerous ritual, and that's a laudable goal. But the farmer is like, hey, it's supposed to be sola scriptura now, pastor, so you show me where it says I can't use these words when I've got fires that need to be put out. What I'd really like to know is the content of the ritual that the farmer wanted to use. If it was something like, fires, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, be stopped, then it would be particularly difficult to rule this out, especially in a Protestant context, since there are biblical examples of Jesus rebuking physical things like winds and fevers. But back to Mr. Livingston, how is he going to get relief? According to Father Galitzin's 1839 letter, Mr. Livingston applied to first his Lutheran minister for help, but he having candidly confessed his want of power, he applied to Protestant ministers of different denominations, some of whom promised relief. 
among them a Methodist preacher who went to Livingston's house, accompanied by some of his congregation. Here they begun to pray, but was soon silenced and driven away by a shower of stones thrown amongst them by invisible hands. Not being able to get relief from the ministers he invited to his home, Livingston then sought assistance from practitioners of folk magic. And there was a lot of folk magic being practiced in America back then, as there is also now for that matter. After trying ministers in vain, old Livingston applied to a conjurer in the South Mountains who promised to banish the evil spirits if he, Livingston, would pay him a certain amount of money on the spot. Livingston very wisely refused paying him anything beforehand, but promised him double the amount if he would perform the job. The conjurer would not agree. According to Father Joseph Fanati's 1879 book, The Mystery of the Wizard Clip, three men came from Winchester in order to free the house from what troubled it, if it were the devil himself. But as soon as they entered the house, a large stone was seen to proceed from the fireplace and whirl around upon the floor upward of 15 minutes without any stone being missed, upon which the gentleman instantly sneaked away. Also, Livingston applied to three conjurers who gave some herbs in a book and a riddle to catch the devil. But the first night, the book and herbs were put into the chamber pot and covered with the riddle. So the practitioners of folk magic were not able to provide any more help than the ministers had been. And this, apparently had a depressing effect on Mr. Livingston's faith. According to Father Galitzin, who knew Livingston personally, Poor Livingston went home much dejected, and in consequence of so many disappointments, almost came to the conclusion that Christ had no longer any true ministers on earth, and that those who pretended to be such were only impostors. He was determined henceforth never to apply to any one of those calling themselves ministers of Christ. A Roman Catholic peddler who happened one night to stop at Livingston's and who was much distressed by the noise which prevailed almost the whole night at Livingston's house tried to persuade Mr. Livingston to send for a Catholic priest, but he answered very quickly that he'd tried so many of these fellows he was not going to try any more of them. So at this point, Livingston wasn't inclined to try to get help from pastors anymore. So was he ever able to get any relief? Yeah, and it started when he had a dream. Here is the account given by Anastasia McSherry, one of Livingston's neighbors, who thus knew him personally. At last, Mr. L. had a dream. He thought he was climbing a high mountain and had great difficulty to get up, had to labor hard, catching to roots and bushes. But when he had reached the top, he saw a minister dressed in robes, as he termed it. After looking at the minister for some time, he heard a voice saying, this is the man who can relieve you. His wife heard him groaning in his sleep and awoke him, whereupon he told her his dream and said he did not know of a minister who wore robes, but would inquire early in the morning. Accordingly, he started and traveled to Shepherd Town, where he was told by someone that it was a Catholic priest he was looking for, as priests only dressed in robes, and was directed to go to Mr. Richard McSherry near Lee Town, where he might find one. Late in the evening of the same day, Mrs. McSherry saw him coming up to her house. She met him at the gate, and when he told her what he wanted, to wit, to see the priest, she told him there was none at her house then, but there would be church in Shepherd Town next Sunday. There he could see one. Mrs. McSherry is relating this in the third person, but she's telling the story of what happened with her and her husband and Mr. Livingston. Also, we may want to comment on the particular phrase she used, saying that there would be church in Shepherdton next Sunday. At this time, there were no Catholic churches in this area. And so what you do is you'd have traveling priests come and set up a portable altar and celebrate the sacraments in somebody's home. When that happened, the local custom was to speak of the priest giving church and to speak of the people as who were attending the sacraments as going to church, even though there was no actual church building. Mrs. McSherry picks up the story. Mr. and Mrs. McSherry went to church next Sunday, and there they found Mr. Livingston. As the priest appeared at the altar, Mr. L. was very much overcome, wept bitterly, and exclaimed, This is the man I saw in my dream. He is the one to relieve me. When Mass was over, he went in to talk to the priest and told him his sad story. But the priest, the Reverend Dennis Cahill, 
only laughed at him and told him it was only his neighbors plaguing him and that he must go home and watch for them. Richard McSherry and Mr. Mangini were present and were very much moved by the old man's tears, which made them listen to his sad story and try to comfort him. After much urging and a great deal of persuasion, Mr. Cahill went to Mr. Livingston's, accompanied by Mr. McSherry and Mr. Mangini, and they both questioned the family. Father Galitzin picks up the story in his 1839 letter. During his first visit, Mr. Cahill only said some prayers and sprinkled the house with holy water. On his going away, having already one foot on the door sill and the other inside yet, suddenly a sum of money which had disappeared from out the old man's chest was by invisible hands laid on the door sill between the priest's feet. Moreover, the house became quiet for several days. After a while, the noise and destruction beginning again, Reverend Mr. Cahill paid them a second visit, celebrated Mass in the house, instructed them, took them into the church, and finally the work of destruction ceased. By the way, notice how both Mrs. McSherry and Father Galitzin are referring to Dennis Cahill as Mr. Cahill or Reverend Mr. Cahill, not Father Cahill. This was common at the time. The custom of calling priests father is not a universal in the church, and it's varied with time. In any event, the prayers and holy water produced some initial relief, and the saying of Mass in the house brought the destructive phase of, of the phenomena to an end for now. Uh, I take it that the troubles resumed? Eventually, but there would be other things that would happen first. One of them, as Mrs. McSherry mentioned, was the conversion of the family, uh, having the priest stop the disturbances that your family has been undergoing and that other ministers haven't been able to stop, is pretty impressive, and so Livingston wanted to become Catholic. Father Cahill then gave the family basic instruction in the faith and received them into the church, although one of them, Mrs. Livingston, was rather reluctant. She had a reputation as being stubborn, and she later said that her conversion wasn't really sincere and that she was the family Judas. But now that the destructive manifestations had quieted down, a new set of phenomena began to occur. As stated in the 1873 Life of Father Galitzin, They had scarcely made their profession of faith and heard one or two masses before a bright light awoke Mr. Livingston one night, and a clear, sweet voice told him to arise call his family together, and to pray. He did so. The hours passed as a moment, for the voice prayed with them, leading their prayers. Then it spoke to them in the most simple yet eloquent manner of all the great mysteries of the Catholic faith to which they had assented, and which, as far as they could, vaguely understanding them, they sincerely and firmly believed. The voice would become a regular thing in the Livingston household. I haven't been able to determine the precise chronology of when the voice began speaking, but it reportedly continued speaking to them for 17 years, which would mean until around 1811. It spoke frequently to Mr. Livingston, though other members of the family could hear it also. According to surviving 19th century letters, the children sometimes could see the entity who was speaking, but the adults usually couldn't. In addition to helping them understand aspects of the Catholic faith, the spirit voice also would regularly encourage the family to say prayers and practice various devotions. It would give them information about people who needed spiritual help and it would make predictions about what would happen to specific people if they didn't repent. Among the prayers it would ask for were prayers for the souls in purgatory. So since I know we have a good number of non-Catholic listeners, we should say a few words about the topic of purgatory. What can you tell us about it? One of the things that Christians have virtually universally agreed upon is that after we come to God and he forgives our sins, he doesn't just leave us the way we were. He gives us a new nature, which St. Paul refers to as the new man or a new creation, and he causes us to grow in holiness. This process is known as sanctification because it causes us to grow in sanctity or holiness, and it's a consequence of God's ongoing grace in our lives. Christians also agree that we will not still be sinners in heaven. God will make us absolutely pure so we can be in his presence. The book of Hebrews speaks of the holiness required to see God, and the book of Revelation says that nothing impure will enter the heavenly city. But human experience shows that we're still attached to sin in this life, 
And the process of sanctification usually isn't complete by the time we die. So there needs to still be further sanctification. Therefore, between death and the full glory of heaven, there needs to be a final purification or a final stage of sanctification. This is what Catholics and some others call purgatory. Just like in this life, the process of sanctification can involve discomfort, so too can purgatory. The book of Hebrews talks about how God disciplines us so that we will grow in holiness, but it notes that, you know, discipline does not feel pleasant at the time, but God does it for our own good. And that's the way it works in this life, and based on various passages of Scripture, that's how the church understands the final stage of sanctification, or purgatory, also works. Furthermore, just like you can pray for people who are being sanctified in this life, you can pray for departed loved ones who are being sanctified after they've died. And you don't need to worry about whether their purification is finished or not. Even if they're already out of purgatory, God's outside of time, and he can apply your prayer to whenever it's needed. In fact, the church doesn't teach anything about how long or short purgatory is. It may be instantaneous. Pope Benedict XVI wrote in his encyclical Spes Salvi on Christian hope that purgatory can't be measured in earthly time. And the Bible speaks of those who are still alive at the second coming being transformed in the twinkling of an eye. So we really can't measure how long purgatory takes. We don't know how space and time work in the afterlife. Pope Benedict has also proposed the idea that the final purification is really an encounter with the fiery love of Jesus Christ, who transforms us and burns away all our impurities. However that may be, the idea of this purification, a final freeing from the consequences of sin, even when it's already been forgiven, is a teaching that is older than Christianity. It's part of, it was part of Judaism before the time of Christ, and it's part of Judaism today. It's also part of all the branches of Christianity, except in the Protestant community. Catholics, Orthodox, Copts, Assyrians, Armenians, basically everybody agrees on this, though not all, the, not all use the term purgatory to refer to it. It's really only in the Protestant community that there's significant disagreement about this, and even there, there's been a growing openness to the idea. For example, in his book, Letters to Malcolm, the popular Protestant author C.S. Lewis wrote, Our souls demand purgatory, don't they? Would it not break the heart if God said to us, It is true, my son, that your breath smells and your rags drip with mud and slime, but we are charitable here, and no one will upbraid you with these things, nor draw away from you. Enter into the joy. Should we not reply, With submission, sir, and if there is no objection, I'd rather be cleaned first. It may hurt, you know. Even so, sir. I assume that the process of purification will normally involve suffering, partly from tradition, partly because most real good that has been done me in this life has involved it. But I don't think suffering is the purpose of the purgation. I can well believe that people neither much worse nor much better than I will suffer less than I or more. No nonsense about merit. The treatment given will be the one required whether it hurts little or much. He also wrote about the possibility of praying for those in purgatory, saying, Of course I pray for the dead. The action is so spontaneous, so all but inevitable, that only the most compulsive theological case against it would deter me, and I hardly know how the rest of my prayers would survive if those for the dead were forbidden. At our age, the majority of those we love best are dead. What sort of intercourse with God could I have if what I love best were unmentionable to him? And in recent years, other Protestants have become more open to the idea of purgatory as simply the final stage of sanctification. But back in the 1700s, this was not at all common. And so the Livingstons weren't used to praying for the departed before they became Catholic, and the voice encouraged them to do so. How early are the records we have of the voice? Unfortunately, Livingston and his family don't seem to have left any written records, or at least ones that have survived and been found. But their neighbor, Anastasia McSherry, does refer to the spirit voice in a couple of letters that have survived. These letters are estimated to date to late 1796 and to 1797, so they're very early. In the first one, to her brother, she wrote, Dear Brother, Scarcely had my sister Mrs. Head got three miles from this house when Mr. Livingston came, thinking to find her here. He said the spirit was talking all the night. 
meaning the last night she slept here. He said the first appearance of it was a most glittering light, sometimes in one corner of the house and then in the other, and in an instant the whole house was in so shining a light that he declared he could not look at it. It told him to go to Mr. McSherry's helpmate, meaning me, and tell her to be steadfast in prayer, for the voice said that her parents were in great hope of going to rest, after purgatory, soon. In the second one, she wrote, Dear brother, our poor brother John was very much lamented. The voice called him my son, saying that they, our parents, sent him to the college to become a minister of Jesus Christ, and that he had become a blasphemer, saying that he did not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, that the Church had not the power to forgive sins. Should he die in that unhappy state of mind, he would open his eyes in the raging flames below, among the damned. The voice says our prayers can help him now, while he is still alive, and that we should be as earnest for him as we were for our parents. It has commanded us to go on our knees to him and say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, why will you not believe that there is a God, and that nothing is hard or impossible to him, and that it is as easy for him to give his precious body and blood as to give a cup of water, etc., etc. So here the voice urged the neighbor and her siblings to pray for the salvation of one of their brothers who had lost the faith. It also instructed them to do some basic apologetics with him by pointing out that if an omnipotent God exists, it's infinitely easy for God to do anything he chooses, whether that's giving us a cup of water or giving us his body and blood under the appearances of bread and wine. Everything is infinitely and equally easy if you have unlimited power or omnipotence. Uh, the real question is what God chooses to do, not whether it seems easy or hard from a human perspective. And that's actually good apologetics, and not just from a Catholic perspective, but from a general Christian perspective, since we all believe in miracles, whether it's in the real presence or some other miracles. Miracles seem hard from a human perspective. That's why they're miracles. But they're all equally and infinitely easy for an omnipotent God. What these letters do for our purposes, however, is show that the voice was being reported very early on, by at least 1796 or 1797. You said that the troubles quieted down after Father Cahill said Mass in the Livingston home, but eventually came back. Were they ever freed from them? Yes, and to explain how that happened, we need to introduce a new figure into the story. We've already mentioned him. His name was Father Demetrius Augustine Galitzin. He was born in 1770, and he was 27 years old when he came to visit the Livingstons in 1797. Although he had been born in The Hague in the Netherlands, he was from an aristocratic Russian family. In fact, his father was the Russian ambassador to the Netherlands, and since French was the lingua franca of the day, uh, the language of diplomacy, Demetrius's family spoke French as their household language. Also, because he was an aristocrat, Demetrius himself was a prince. As you would expect, the family was Russian Orthodox, but when Demetrius was 16, his mother became Catholic, and at age 17, Demetrius did too, much to the annoyance of his father. As an aristocratic young man, he naturally traveled, and in 1792, he came to America. To avoid the complications of traveling as a Russian prince, he used the last name Smith and passed as a commoner. His mother had given him letters of introduction, and so he met with Bishop John Carroll of Baltimore, the first and only bishop in the United States at the time. He then made a radical life decision and decided to permanently forego being a Russian aristocrat and to become a Catholic priest instead, which shocked and horrified his father once he learned about it because he wanted Demetrius to have a military career. Very quickly, and I mean in little more than a week, he entered the seminary in Baltimore and he was ordained three years later in 1795, becoming the first priest in the United States to have all of his formation done in this country. Also, unlike other priests of the era, he wasn't called just Mr. Galitzin or Reverend Mr. Galitzin. Since he was a prince, he was often called Reverend Prince Galitzin. 
He was assigned to a mission in a town with the awesome name Port Tobacco, Maryland, although he was transferred to the less awesomely named community Conewago in southern Pennsylvania. He has a very interesting life story, and he was a famous missionary who became known as the Apostle of the Alleghenies, meaning the Allegheny Mountains in the eastern United States. In 1945, there was even a four-page comic book story made about his life, and we'll have a link to that in the further resources. Also, he was the subject of the StarQuest podcast, American Catholic History. You can go back and listen to their episode 10 to learn about the life of Father Galitzin. He died in 1840 at the age of 69, and currently there is a cause for his possible canonization as a saint. And in 2005, he was given the title Servant of God. So how did Father Galitzin become involved in this story? After the phenomena began to be reported in 1794, word about them naturally started to spread, and by the summer of 1797, word had reached Father Galitzin up in Conewago, Pennsylvania, only about 70 miles away. So in September of that year, he made the trip down to Virginia. As he wrote in 1839, My view in coming to Virginia and remaining there three months was to investigate those extraordinary facts at Livingston's, of which I had heard so much at Conewago, and which I could not prevail upon myself to believe. But I was soon converted to a full belief of them. No lawyer in a court of justice did ever examine or cross-examine witnesses more strictly than I did all those I could procure. So Galitzin went there as a skeptic, and he says he ruthlessly cross-examined the witnesses he found. And he became a witness himself. In the 1873 book, Life of Demetrius Augustus Galitzin, it records, When Father Galitzin was there, the disturbances having recommenced, he intended, as he related afterwards to Reverend Mr. Bradley, to exorcise the evil spirits for good and all. But as he commenced, the rattling and rumbling as of innumerable wagons with which they filled the house worked so upon his nerves that he could not command himself sufficiently to read the exorcism so that he was obliged to go for Reverend Mr. Cahill, a man of powerful nerve and hearty faith, who returned with him to Livingston's, and, bidding all to kneel down, commanded the evil spirits to leave the house, without doing any injury to anyone there. After a stubborn resistance on the part of the devil, they were finally conquered and compelled to obey the priest. Afterwards, Mr. Cahill said mass there, and there was no more trouble. So now that a full exorcism had been done on the place, the destructive phase finally stopped. However, the voice continued to speak to the members of the family until around 1811. You mentioned that Mrs. Livingston later said her conversion was not really sincere. So what did she make of the voice? I don't have as much information on this as I'd like, in part because we don't have surviving records written by members of the Livingston family. The records we do have do not suggest that she thought the voice was imaginary. The people who met her portray her as regarding the voice as real. In fact, they say that she heard it herself and even heard it more frequently than some other family members. However, they report that she took a disapproving attitude towards it, and at various times tried to resist what it said. For example, she didn't like saying the Hail Mary with the voice because of her Presbyterian background. The voice also gave her instructions about how to help people spiritually, and she sometimes refused to do so. For example, according to one account from the 1800s, While Mrs. Livingston was away from her own house, she lived at the house of a Quaker who had a daughter that was sick. And during her sickness, she told Mrs. Livingston that she wanted some spiritual assistance, but did not know what it was. Mrs. Livingston knew very well what it was, for the voice had told her it was baptism. But the parents of the girl, being opposed to it, she died without baptism. The voice then told Mrs. Livingston that this would appear against her in the day of judgment. So the voice warned Mrs. Livingston that God wasn't happy with the fact that she hadn't told the girl that the spiritual help she was asking for was baptism, presumably out of deference to her parents, since Quakers don't normally practice baptism. She should have been willing to risk the disapproval of the parents and tell the girl that Christ actually said for us to be baptized. One of the predictions that the voice made was that Mrs. Livingston would die in her own home, and according to the same account... It told her that she should die in her own house, and in order to falsify it when she took sick, she at first would not go home, for she had been so much reprimanded by the voice that she left her house some time before she took sick. 
but at last was forced to beg to be taken home and thus fulfilled the prediction by dying in her own house. Other predictions made by The Voice also came true. For example, one of them concerned the neighbor, Mr. McSherry, the husband of Anastasia, whose letters we read. He had gotten into an argument with the local priest and... Mr. McSherry, having had some little difference with the priest, did not go to communion for three years, at the latter end of which he took sick and was at the point of death. The Voice then told Livingston to tell Mr. McSherry to touch Christ through the church and he should be restored to his family, which happened accordingly, for having received communion, the next day he was able to walk about, and in a few days perfectly recovered. And there were many other spiritual manifestations, including the voice. However, we're dealing with Skinwalker Ranch-level activity here, so there are too many for us to go into in this episode. If you'd like to learn more, check out the books that we'll have in further resources. What happened to the Livingston family in later years? The kids grew up and moved out and had lives of their own, of course. Mr. Livingston ended up moving back to Pennsylvania. He lived within 20 miles of Father Galitzin, and they stayed in touch until he passed on, which was in 1820, 26 years after the manifestations began. And he remained a faithful Catholic till the end of his life. Also, in 1802, he and his wife donated 35 acres of their property in Virginia to the church as a field to sustain a priest in thanksgiving for the help they had been given. Since that time, it's been known as the priest's field. The voice told Livingston that before the end of time, the place would become a great place of prayer and fasting and praise. And in 1983, the Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston, dedicated the Priest Field Pastoral Center on the property, and retreats are conducted there today. So spiritual exercises like prayer and fasting and praise are indeed being conducted there. Also, in the town of Middleway, there are a bunch of historical markers that have been put up, which include pictures of crescent moons and scissors in honor of the wizard clip and the marks that it made on clothing. We'd like to take a moment here to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Marco P., Father John, Jessica K., Jordan P., and Keith C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by The Light Series by Jacqueline Brown, a best-selling Catholic fiction series that will leave you asking, who would I become if the world fell away? Enter code MYSTERIOUSWORLD at Jacqueline-Brown.com for 10% off. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the wizard clip? From the reason perspective, we need to consider several possibilities. First, nothing like these events happened, so it's all just a legend and there's no basis for this story. Second, there is a basis for the story, and it's due to hoaxing. Third, something like these events did occur, but they had a natural and conventional explanation. Fourth, that they had a natural but extraordinary explanation, like aliens because it's, it's always, always aliens. aliens. And fifth, that something like these events did occur, and it has at least a partially supernatural explanation. Suppose that there was a supernatural explanation. What could we say about it from the faith perspective? It would seem that there would be three basic possibilities. First, the phenomena were due to demons because it's, it's always, always demons. demons. Second, the phenomena were due to a soul in purgatory. And third, that the phenomena were due to both demons and a soul in purgatory. Okay, so what can we say about the wizard clip from the reason perspective? How likely is it that this is all just due to legend and there's no real basis for the story? 
when I first started looking into this, I noticed that the books that are available on it, especially the ones that are still in print, were written substantially later than the events they described. So this legend possibility needs to be taken into account. At least I needed to at the start of my research. However, upon digging into the materials, there's actually quite a lot of evidence that is much earlier than the books. And they quote from those earlier sources. So we've got primary source quotations that are very early. One of the books we'll have a link to is Father Fanati's book, The Mystery of the Wizard Clip, which is actually a compendium of earlier sources, and it includes documents written by people who knew the Livingstons and who were there when the activity was going on. Uh, in particular, it includes documents written by Father Galitzin, who was there in 1797, just three years after the phenomena started and while they were still being reported. Also, it includes letters written by the neighbor, Anastasia McSherry, dating from 1796 and 1797, in which she discusses the phenomena that were being reported then. So this can't just be a legend. These things really were being reported by people who were on the ground at the time. Whether the phenomena were real or not is a separate question, but the reports are not just legends. Also, there was physical evidence that needs to be accounted for because of all the clothing and other items that the phenomena affected, and these continued to be in people's possession for some time. According to the 1873 Life of Father Galitzin, Father Galitzin carried a trunk full of clothing, which had been cut to pieces during this period of destruction, back to Conewago, where they've been seen, even of late years, by eminent priests who have added their testimony to the truth of these occurrences. Among these clothes, however, are said to have been one or two garments marked in quite a different manner, one bearing the impress as of a hand burnt in the cloth, the other in IHS made in the same manner. And we should mention that IHS is a monogram for in hoc signo, which is short for a Christian slogan in Latin that means in this sign, in hoc signo, in this sign, meaning the sign of the cross, you shall conquer. In any event, the idea that this was a legend, therefore just won't do, the legend hypothesis would explain reports made many years after the relevant time frame. But we need to explain reports that were made contemporaneously or near contemporaneously by the people involved. Having said that, we don't have a lot of detailed documentation that was made during the period itself. If there were more documents than we have, additional letters, for example, they either haven't survived or haven't been found. So quite a few of the claims are found in documents that date from 30 to 70 years later, and they're based on people's memories of the time. This kind of oral history situation is like the one we faced in episode 44 on John Hendricks, the Tennessee prophet. And because people's memories can be fuzzy, oral history has to be treated with some caution. It would not surprise me if there is some exaggeration and misremembering going on in the later reports. But some doesn't allow us to dismiss all, and we need to be especially attentive to the broad strokes that appear in multiple later accounts and to the specific details that we have early contemporaneous reports of, like in Anastasia McSherry's letters. I don't think every claim made in Later documents necessarily reflects what was being reported early on, but the gist and the specific details that we can document from the early period should be accurate. If there's a basis for the reports, could they be due to hoaxing? This is another possibility that always has to be considered, as we saw in episode 109 on the Cottingley Fairies. In this case, to establish a hoax, we need to identify a person or group of people as the plausible hoaxers. And there are also three types of evidence that we need to consider. The physical evidence, the sounds that people heard, and the evidence provided by the voice. Each of these kinds of evidence is something that, in principle, could be faked. Somebody could have used scissors or knives to cut moon shapes in the clothing. Somebody could have made the handprint or the other symbols that appeared on cloth. Somebody could have used a pair of shears to make clipping noises or use primitive sound effects 
you know, sound effect techniques to generate the, what sounded like horses galloping, and somebody could have falsely claimed to have heard a voice. The most plausible people to do such hoaxing would be one or more members of the Livingston family, as it's hard to see how an outsider would have sufficient access to the property in the house to trick the family. Let's look at the family then. Could the whole family have been in on the hoax? There are several reasons that this is improbable. The first one is with two adults and seven children, there would have been a significant possibility that one or more of them would reveal the hoax, at least in later years, and apparently none of them did. Also, there's the fact that the whole family became Catholic, and that's not something you did lightly in 1794 in Virginia. Catholics were a very small minority and were subject to a lot of discrimination. Becoming Catholic severely lowered your social standing in the eyes of most of your neighbors. If you wanted to hoax having spirit phenomena in your house, you know, for attention or whatever, you could easily do it without dragging Catholicism into it and lowering your family's social standing. The family also doesn't seem to have had any other obvious incentive to stage a hoax, as they apparently didn't make money out of this. Then there's the fact that one member, Mrs. Livingston, took a notably dim attitude towards the voice, even though she apparently heard it. And further, even though she later walked back her conversion, she didn't say that the whole thing was false, and continued to act as if the spiritual phenomena were real, even though she didn't like what the voice said. Finally, there's the fact that outsiders apparently saw and heard some of the, of the phenomena, and especially if some of those claims are accurate, like a stone coming out of the fireplace and moving around the room, it's hard to explain how this would have been hoaxed by the family. All told, the idea of that the whole family were a bunch of hoaxers doesn't strike me as particularly plausible. Oh, so what about the possibility that it wasn't the whole family, but only one or more members? Once again, we have the three kinds of evidence that need to be explained, the altered physical objects, the sounds people heard, and what the voice said. Even though it's reported that all the family members heard the voice, it's definitely for certain that Mr. Livingston did. Uh, you know, that's mentioned in Anastasia's letters. He was coming over saying, the voice told me this. Therefore, regardless of how the other evidence would be explained, any hoax theory would have to involve him making up what the voice allegedly told him. He would have to be a hoaxer. However, of all the family members, he isn't a plausible hoaxer when it comes to the voice. It told him to pray for hours with the family, to perform a large number of devotional exercises, including 40-day fasts, and to make trips to deliver messages to people. And he did those things. So all of this for no profit and a diminished social standing? You know, that doesn't sound like someone who's hoaxing a voice. And he remained a faithful Catholic till his death, who, by everybody's account, was very sincere in his faith. So he doesn't sound like a hoaxer. It sounds like he believed the voice was real. What if there was a different natural explanation, like imagination or mental illness on his part? That could explain the voice, but it wouldn't explain the other kinds of evidence, the physically altered objects and the sounds that people heard, including outsiders. I suppose it's hypothetically possible that he could have had a mental illness so profound that he both faked the physical objects and hallucinated the voice, but that kind of mental illness would be so profound it should show evidence in other areas of his life, and this doesn't seem to be the case. People, including priests like Father Galitzin, who knew him for years, did not regard him as mentally ill. Alternately, one could propose that someone else in the family, and the best bet would be one or more of the children, faked the physical objects, and then got Dad imagining that he was hearing the voice. However, when the voice starts telling Dad to gather the family together in prayer for hours and do 40-day fasts, even partial fasts, that's a pretty strong incentive for the kids to come clean about the physical objects they faked that started all of this, and none of them did. And while a kid who was outside the room might be able to fake the sound of scissors clipping when visitors were in the house, 
it's likely they would have been discovered. You know, it's like people would notice, hey, Clark Kent is never around at the same time as Superman. You know, why do we <laughs> only hear the, Why do we only hear the Clippers when this kid isn't in the room, or when one of the kids isn't in the room? And I don't know how the kids would fake the sounds of horses galloping around the house for visitors like Father Galitzin when there were no horses to be seen outside the windows. Thus, while I believe in thoroughly exploring all the conventional explanations that could be offered, there are enough reports of enough different kinds under enough different circumstances that I can't simply embrace one of the conventional explanations easily. I think we have to take seriously the idea of an exotic explanation for these reports. Well, what about an exotic but natural one like aliens? You can explain anything you want by appealing to advanced alien technology. However, being able to explain it that way and offering evidence for that explanation are two different things. And we don't have evidence of alien activity here. The fact is the phenomena presented themselves as supernatural in nature, not extraterrestrial in nature. And we need to interpret phenomena in light of how they present themselves until we have evidence to the contrary. You know, that's just Occam's razor. Don't multiply entities beyond the evidence. If it doesn't look like aliens, don't assume it's aliens. So not having any evidence to the contrary, the logical explanation for these phenomena is that they were supernatural. Okay, that brings us then to the faith perspective. What can we say about the wizard clip from the faith perspective? The first question we need to look at is whether we're dealing with one phenomenon here or two. At first glance, it looks like two. There were the destructive manifestations that occurred early on and that were progressively ameliorated by the holy water, saying mass, and performing an exorcism followed by another mass. Then there were the non-destructive manifestations that included the voice and its exhortations to prayer and spiritual exercises and helping other people spiritually. The manifestations presented themselves as two different phenomena, and in keeping with the principle that I just mentioned, interpreting phenomena as they present themselves until you get evidence to the contrary, our starting assumption should be that the Livingston family was confronted by two different things, both of a supernatural nature. Both of them, though, are likely tied to the death of the Irish visitor who Mr. Livingston did not summon a priest for, since that seemed to initiate the overall chain of events. Taking things at face value, the first and destructive phenomenon is most obviously explained as the activity of demons. The destructiveness of these manifestations is consistent with the activity of demons, so is the fact that they ceased following an exorcism. And the naturalness of this explanation is attested by the fact that this was how the people who were present, like Father Galitzin, interpreted the destructive phenomenon. On this theory, Livingston's failure to provide spiritual care for a dying man led to a withdrawal of enough protection for the family to allow demons to become active and thus motivate the family to take steps to grow closer to God. And then what about the second non-destructive phenomenon connected with the voice? This started as the first phenomenon began to subside, even if the exorcism hadn't been done yet. Since the voice exhorted the family to grow closer to God and to help others do so as well, the voice would not be understood naturally as demonic. In fact, the voice said that it had once been in the flesh. And meaning a, a living human being, and that if Mr. Livingston persisted, he would learn before his death who it had been. I haven't found a reference to that happening, but it seems to me that the most likely candidate would be the traveler who died in their home. His soul would have an ongoing interest in the family, and the fact he didn't get the last rites could mean that he would have a more difficult final purification, and that could mean that he was now a soul in purgatory, which would be consistent with his exhortations for the family to pray for those in such a condition. In fact, the idea that he was a soul being purified was a common interpretation, or at least that the phenomena were due to a soul that was being purified, was a common interpretation of what was going on in the 1800s, according to the 1873 Life of Father Galitzin. Scarcely had the Livingston family been relieved from the torments of the devil than they were visited by a consoling voice, which remained with them for 17 years 
It has been supposed that this voice came from some soul suffering in purgatory, for some reason permitted to visit, console, and finally to instruct the family. This may perhaps have been in return for the hospitality shown the poor Catholic who died at their house. In any event, the second non-destructive phenomenon was likely linked to the fact that the family had been growing closer to God due to the earlier destructive phenomenon. And now that they, now that that was happening, now that they were getting closer to God, they were given the opportunity to grow even closer by encountering this voice and getting spiritual instruction from it. So at face value, it looks like the unprovisioned death of the traveler led first to an outbreak of demonic activity, followed by manifestations from a soul in purgatory, which I suspect may have been the traveler himself. You said at face value. Is there a but attached to that assessment? Yes, since all this seems to have stemmed from the death of the traveler, I can't help wondering if both phenomena were really different manifestations of the same thing. Just because something is destructive, just because something destructive happens, doesn't mean it's due to demons. In fact, in the Bible, the good angels are depicted sometimes as doing destructive things as part of God's will, you know, like to encourage repentance. Destruction, or natural evil, and sin, or spiritual evil, are two different things, and destruction isn't automatically sinful. So if Livingston needed to be taught a lesson to help him and his family grow closer to God, I can't rule out the possibility that God would allow good angels or the soul of the traveler in purgatory to manifest in a way that was initially destructive in order to motivate them, and then, as they began to respond, to manifest in a gentler way. On this theory, the spiritual efforts they went to, you know, bringing priests in to bless the house and say Mass there, may have provided enough assistance to the departed soul to help him with his transition and thus change the way that the phenomena manifested. The biggest argument I can think of against this view is that the destructive stuff stopped following an exorcism. But that wasn't the only thing that happened. There were also prayers and spiritual exercises and at least one other Mass that was said. And so the fact an exorcism occurred in proximity to the cessation of the destructive phenomenon could have been a coincidence. For You know, since the spiritual world goes beyond our ability to fully envision, the actual answer may have been even more subtle and more complicated than the possibilities I've laid out. Are there any other things we should mention before we close? There was never an official church investigation into these events, so there's no official ruling on them. At the time, the resources in the American Catholic Church were stretched extremely thin, as illustrated by the fact they didn't even have regular priest coverage in this part of Virginia, so it's not surprising that there wasn't an official investigation. However, multiple churchmen of the time, including Fathers Cahill and Galitzin, were on hand and were convinced by what they saw and heard. As we heard earlier, Father Galitzin even mentioned that he sharply cross-examined everybody like a lawyer in court. And although we didn't mention this, Mr. Livingston at one point met Bishop John Carroll of Baltimore, and he was convinced too. So all that's significant. If you'd like to learn how reports of private revelations are handled today, go back and listen to episode 84 on private revelations, and you can apply the principles we use today retrospectively and see what you think. If you do further research into the wizard clip, though, I'd also give a couple of cautions. First, although some of the accounts we have were very early, like Anastasia McSherry's letters, and although some were written by people who had been on the scene, like her and Father Galitzin, many of the accounts were written decades afterwards. Consequently, you shouldn't take every claim in them as necessarily accurate. The gist and the details that can be verified from the early sources will be the most reliable, but other details may have been due to misremembering by the witnesses or exaggeration on the part of a secondary source summarizing what happened. It's also to be borne in mind that Private revelation is accommodated to the recipients and that the seer's consciousness can add details to the underlying fundamental message God is trying to give them, as we covered back in episode 84. Therefore, 
one shouldn't treat things that the voice said as if it's, you know, text out of one of the Gospels. Again, if an account of what is said is historically reliable, the gist may be accurate, but the details should not be pressed. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the wizard clip? The wizard clip is a fascinating story. When I first started researching it, I was skeptical, but there is enough here that I think we need to take the idea of a supernatural origin for these events seriously. We need to be careful about pressing the details, but the basic supernaturality of them is reasonable. The face value interpretation is that the unprovisioned death of the traveler led to first to an outbreak of demonic activity, and then as the family responded spiritually and got priests involved, they received private revelation from a soul that was being purified and who may have been the traveler himself, though other explanations are possible. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners? We'll have a link to Father Joseph Fanati's 1879 book, The Mystery of the Wizard Clip, also the 1873 book, Life of Demetrius Augustus Galitzin, the 1868 memoir on the life and character of Galitzin, the 1904 article in the West Virginia Historical Magazine Quarterly, like that name is like a (laughs) train made out of train cars or something, West (laughs) Virginia Historical Magazine Quarterly. Okay. We'll also have links to articles on the wizard clip, a couple on Father Galitzin, the official site for Father Galitzin's canonization, as well as the 1945 comic book story that you can read online about Father Galitzin's life, and also the American Catholic history episode on Father Galitzin. Very good. Excellent. Uh, And uh, I'm sure we're going to hear more about Father Galitzin on American Catholic history. They've told me Uh, He's going to be appearing more. He's an interesting historical figure. Yeah. So uh, let's turn to our mysterious feedback. Uh, This week, our our episode has run long today, and we've gotten a lot of really good feedback lately. So what we're going to do is give you a special bonus episode where we're going to deal just with a lot of that mysterious feedback we've gotten. So that'll be in addition to the usual mystery we'll be covering next Friday. So look for that coming up. So, Jimmy, uh, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? People may remember a sketch, uh, at least if you're old enough, you may remember a sketch from Saturday Night Live back in the 70s. It was right after the movie Jaws had come out. And so they did a sketch called Land Shark, which was about a exactly what you would think, (laughs) a shark that traveled on the land and that would like ring the doorbells of women and get them to open the door and then eat them. And they'd play the Jaws theme as like the woman's going up to the door to talk to the land shark. And it would use various ruses. It would say like candy gram <laughs> or telegram. You're or that wily plumber. land shark. No, no, just a tuna man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and once finally it says land shark and the, and the woman says, oh, George, quit kidding. And she opens the door. <laughs> well, it turns out land sharks are real and they found them. So we'll have a link to an article about a land shark that is it's able to climb up on land using its fins to chase its prey in, in like tidal reef areas, you know, like tide pool type areas. It'll come up out of the water to chase a crab or something. Fortunately, it is small enough it doesn't chase humans. But <laughs> yeah. they warn they may not have found all the species of land sharks yet. Also, speaking of things that are that people haven't found, the British Science Museums group is asking for people to help them find explanations for a bunch of odd objects. You know, people deposit interesting things in museums over the course of time, and sometimes the knowledge of exactly what this thing was gets lost. And so there are a number of objects in these science museums that people are looking either, either they don't know what this thing is at all, or they at least are looking for more information about it. So check out the link and see if you can identify or provide any more information on these objects. To me, one of them looks like a melon baller. Mm. I mean, it looks like you'd take it and scoop a little ball out of a cantaloupe. But uh, a lot of them are really weird. So check them out. 
All right. And on those land sharks, it's 2020. Of course, there's land sharks. We've had murder hornets. <laughs> yeah. Now there are land sharks. What's next? Uh, all right. So well, now I want to turn to the listener uh, to ask you what your theories are about the wizard clip or uh, any further insights you might have. You can let us know online by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Well, obviously, we're going to have the mysterious feedback special, which will be a bonus episode during the course of the week. And then next Friday, we'll be looking at Ingo Swan's book, Penetration, a story involving remote viewing secret alien bases on the moon. It's been a while since we've had a UFO related story. And so we're going to be combining remote viewing and secret alien bases. And we'll uh, be telling you all about that. I am looking forward to that. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends uh, and write a review uh, in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. That helps us grow our community of listeners and reach more people. And people need to be hearing the stories of the wizard clip and alien bases on the moon seen by remote viewing and all the other things that we talk about. Uh, so please help us to, uh, to reach those uh, new audiences. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>